Um, today, we're going to do uh, chapter four. A lot of stuff in this chapter, right? Um, <clears throat> back in chapter one, I said I thought that the most important concept in here was dimensional analysis in terms of variability of use, what you're going to be doing with it, because you can use it in physics, math, other areas of science. But chapter four, this is all about chemistry. Okay, this is chemistry. Um, <clears throat> we know the periodic table. We know that it's uh, kind of a collection of orderly information. It's got symbols for the elements. It's got atomic numbers, mass numbers, as well as other things uh, that we quite probably might not ever use. But let's take a look at a mass number for a minute. Can you guys see that okay? In the back? Yeah? Um, let's take the mass number of carbon, for example. We look at a periodic table and we see the mass number of carbon is 12.01, right? Everybody see that? 12.01 what? What? What is it? How come it's not written AMU? Isn't it curious? All I've been harping on is numbers and units. Number without a unit is worthless. Unit without a number is worthless. But then we look on the periodic table and we see that there are no units associated with our mass numbers. Isn't that interesting? Right? Well, <clears throat> the reason is because there are two equally important units that can be associated with those mass numbers. One you already know, the AMU or atomic mass unit. So, in AMUs, in um, atomic mass units. That is an AMU. It's just a really small mass unit. Something used when we're dealing with really small things like protons, neutrons, and electrons. If you have the atomic or the mass number in AMUs, you have the mass of one atom of that element. This is the mass of one carbon atom, which in our case, we look at carbon, it's got an atomic number six, mass number 12. We're looking at six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons in a neutral carbon atom. In reality, the mass numbers are the nuclear mass because the mass of an electron is very, very, very small compared to the mass of the protons and the neutrons. So when you're talking about mass numbers, you're talking really about nuclear mass. So you're talking about the mass only of the nucleus. Okay? So mass numbers in AMUs, one atom. Mass numbers in grams, that is the mass of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms.
Anybody ever seen this number before? No? This is called Avogadro's number. This is Avogadro's number, named after Amadeus Avogadro, the guy who discovered it. Okay? So, 12.01 grams of carbon is the mass of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. This is the mass of one mole of carbon. The mole. <coughs> mole is nothing more than a quantity used in chemistry. Now, this is not unfamiliar to us. We already associate a word with a number. Okay? If I asked you how many roses in a dozen roses, what would you say? Twelve. If I asked you how many bananas in a dozen bananas, you'd say twelve. You already associate the word dozen with the number 12, right? 12 defines a dozen. 12 things define a dozen. And only after you specify what you want a dozen of, do you change the word things into whatever you specify. Roses, bananas. But you could say 12 things per dozen, right? The mole is the exact same way. Except the mole doesn't specify 12, it specifies 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. Okay? Everybody see that? So a mole is defined by a number of things. One mole of roses would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd roses. We don't use it. use it that way, right? Okay? And we have a mole of any one of those elements. Pick an element. Pick its mass number. Go to the balance. Weigh out that amount. And you have one mole. Okay? Carbon. You go and you weigh out 12.01 grams of carbon, you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon, or one mole of carbon. 22.98 grams of sodium, you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of sodium, or one mole of sodium. Everybody with me? This is extremely important that you understand this. Okay? Mass number in AMUs, one atom. Mass number in grams, have a Gadro's number of atoms, or one mole. Okay? Pretty good so far. Okay. Well, if we look at what we just said with respect to different atoms, can we extend that concept to include formulas, compounds? Mass of H2O. 
That's going to be mass of one oxygen, which is 16.00, and the mass of two hydrogen. Right? Let's see what we got for hydrogen over here. Let's say that's two. I took the formula, which I was given, and I added up the mass of the individual elements represented in the formula, making sure that I was consistent with the number of each element represented in the formula. There are two hydrogens, one oxygen. Everybody see that? Okay? This is called the formula mass, for obvious reasons, right? It's a formula mass. But here we go again. No units, right? Do you think they can have the same units, AMUs and grams? Yes, they can. So if I put AMUs on there, what do you think that represents? One what? One what? But water doesn't contain one atom. It contains three. Doesn't it? And are those elements, what are those atoms? They're non-metals, right? So what does that make water? Ionic or covalent? Covalent. Whenever you see non-metals, covalent. Remember last lecture? And covalent compounds exist as what? Molecules or crystal structures? Molecules. Somebody's doing their work. One person. Remember, ionic compounds contain a metal. You have your periodic table, so you know where your metals are versus your non-metals. If you see a metal, ionic. Ionic compounds exist as crystals because our most common ionic the one we should be most familiar with is common table salt, which is sodium chloride, right? Sodium's the metal. You don't have a molecule of salt. You have a crystal of salt. So if you have a metal, you are ionic, and you exist as a lattice, a crystal lattice structure. If you have non-metals, you are covalent, and you exist as a molecule. So this formula mass in AMUs would then represent the mass of one molecule of water. You have the mass of one molecule of water. What do you think 18 grams would represent? One mole. One mole, which is how many molecules of water? That's right. 18 grams of water is the mass of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water. Or, stated differently, the mass of one mole of water. <clears throat> you have to start to become the, familiar with this, right? I mean, you have to know non-metals, covalent, metal present, ionic, covalent, molecules, ionic, crystal structures. Right? We never refer to any compound that contains a metal as a molecule. It's improper. Okay? 
Everybody with me? AMUs versus grams. All right. Let's try. NaCl. NaCl. <clears throat> the mass of NaCl would be the mass of one sodium and the mass of one chlorine. Sodium is 23.00. The chlorine is 35.45. I think. 22.99. What's that? 22.99. Oh, I know. Is, it, is that what it says on ours? Yeah. Let's use 23. I don't want to do all that adding. Fifty eight point four five. Fifty eight point four five AMU of NACL would be the mass of what? Yeah, it's a tough one, huh? One crit. Uh, what it is, is we refer to it as a formula unit. One formula unit. The mass of one formula unit. It's one Na, one Cl. Fifty-eight point four five grams of NaCl. Mass of what? Of formal units, right? This is the mass of six point oh two times ten to the twenty-third formula units. Or the mass of one mole NaCl. Okay. When you look at how the structure of NaCl forms, it's a cube. More specifically, it's a body center cube. So when you look at it, Try and take my art class here. I'm gonna go back and across and come down here like this. And I'm gonna go there. And you're gonna have your Cl minuses like this. And in between, attracted, you'll have your little Na pluses in the little wedges there. And this will form a body center cube. It's a cube of, say, chlorine, chlorides, and then a sodium in the middle of the cube. That means it's body center. The ratio of Na's to Cl's is given by the formula, which is one to one. Okay? The crystal sizes obviously can vary. Okay? You can have some crystals that are much bigger than other crystals, but the ratio will always be the same. So you could have a crystal and I'm just grabbing numbers, you could have a crystal that contained 10 million ions. It would be 5 million Na pluses and 5 million Cl minuses because it's one to one. Or you could have a crystal that contains only 100,000 ions, in which case it would contain 50,000 Na pluses and 50,000 Cl minuses. Now, under this type of scenario, the concept of a molecule doesn't even apply, right? All you can talk about is formula units 
how many NaCl pairs do I have? Okay, and this is what we mean when we say formula unit. We're just talking about the mass of the ionic compound given by the formula, which also gives us the ratio of the ions in whatever crystal lattice structure they have. Okay, so technically, when we take the molar mass here, we could call the mass for water a molecular mass because it's a molecule. Some people say molecular weight. I don't like the use of the word weight in any area of science. It should be mass, okay? Because weight's actually a force acting on mass. So you could say molecular mass, but with NaCl, you can't use that because this isn't a molecule. Well, we get around that by simply saying, look, the sum total of the element's masses given by any formula is the molar mass. Now it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're talking about an ionic or covalent. When you add them all up in grams, this is the molar mass. So 58.45, if we do NaCl, 58.45 grams of NaCl per one mole of NaCl. Right? Molar mass. What is that? Who said that? That's right. It's a conversion, isn't it? It's a conversion because we have a different unit in the top than we have in the bottom. So, we have as many conversion factors given by the periodic table as formulas, right? Because every formula will have a grams of X per mole of X, whatever it is. Every formula, you can add up its masses and generate a conversion, which allows you now to go to convert masses into number of moles. And if you can convert them into moles, you can convert them into formula units or molecules or even atoms. You can figure out, in fact, we're going to do that. We'll figure out how many gold atoms are in, let's, let's do them, in a certain mass of gold. Everybody good on this? So important that you be able to that you that you understand it. Yeah. Box. What is? Who's that box? This was it was just a cube of salt. Oh, it's a body centered cube. Yeah. Yeah. This is just how. If you could look at the salt that you're dumping out on your table, that's what it would look like. They, they used to have an SEM, scanning electron micrograph, an SEM of a, of of a. Cube of salt. It's crazy. It's pretty crazy. I don't know what happened to that. Someone probably took it. Now, we're going to use a couple of different skills here. We're going to use our dimensional analysis, and now we're going to use our newly found um, conversion factors that allow us to convert between grams per mole and moles to particles. Don't be confused by that word particle. Okay? One mole, if I say one dozen is 12, but one dozen what? One dozen things is 12 things. That's the conversion. And you make it specific for your situation whenever you say roses. Now one dozen roses or 12 roses. The mole is the same thing. One mole, and notice the abbreviation used, we drop the E when we're using it for dimensional analysis. I don't know why that is. Just drop it off. One mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Okay? Now, don't be confused by this particles, this word particles here. Don't let it throw you off. The only reason why it's particles is because we didn't define it. 
We could use it, we could have used it for water, then we would have said one mole of water is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd waters. One mole of uh, NaCl, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of NaCl. So the particles is just a generic term because it can apply to so many different things and you're going to substitute in what that is when the time comes. Okay? So let's just try one. Um, let's calculate the number of. Um, let's pick. Let's pick an interesting one. Say um, gold. Let's calculate the number of gold atoms. in um, three hundred and twenty six grams of gold. Don't let these problems get the best of you, okay? This is nothing more than a conversion. This is nothing more than what did we do the first day? Years to seconds or something like that? It's the same way. You're just not as familiar with the conversions. Right? So let's start with our given information, which is 326 grams of gold. I don't have any idea where I'm going to go. The only thing I know is that if I have grams of gold in the top here, I have to have grams of gold in the bottom in my next one. So they cancel. So where do I want to take my grams of gold to? Well, I want to know atoms. Now the only place I've seen atoms is with Avogadro's number, right? And what does Avogadro's number define again? One what? Mole. mole. One mole. Is there anything else that we know of that defines one mole that we can use Avogadro's number per one mole to cancel out with? What is that? What else defines a mole? Avogadro's number defines a mole. Remember when I was writing them up here? I'd always write one thing and then right under it I'd write another thing. What was that? What was I writing that after? Mm -hmm. What's that? Adam. Yeah. What was that after? Mass number in what? Mm -hmm. In what? Mass numbers in what? What's one mole? That's one. Give me another one. What's one mole? No. Mass number in what? Grams. Thank you. You guys are dancing all around it. Isn't the mass number of any element in grams? or the mass number of any formula in grams equal to one mole. Yeah, yeah, didn't we just have up there 58.45 grams of NaCl per one mole? So, if I know the mass number of gold in grams, oh, what a coincidence, I can convert it to a mole. Just so happens I have a periodic table over here. 196.97 196.97 grams of gold in one mole of gold. Grams on the top, grams on the bottom. Can you see where I'm going? Yeah. Okay. 
one mole of gold, what is that? Now you can say Avogadro, right? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of gold. Moles cancel out. All I have to do is a little math. What is it? 9.6 times? Times 10 to the 23rd. Yep, that's what I got. Uh, we'll go how many significant digits? 3, right? 9.96 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of gold. reactions actually occur on a particle-to-particle -particle basis, right? It's either a molecule reacting with a molecule or an atom reacting with an uh, atom or an atom reacting with a molecule. Either way, it's on a molecular or an atomic level. <clears throat> these are huge numbers, right? We don't want to deal with these. They're cumbersome. And sometimes you're going to have to do these calculations, but they're primarily of a historical importance. We don't really ever want to know how many atoms of silver we have. That's not practical. But we do know that if we calculate the number of moles, we have something that is directly proportional or can lead us to the exact number of atoms. But the mole is a much easier quantity to work with, and that's where its value is, and that's why we use it. We could get it down to the atom-to-atom -atom interaction but that would require us to use huge numbers. So we use moles instead. Anything you get in moles, anytime you have moles, and you will have them, you can get to particular particles by simply using this conversion. Will you have to do it? No, probably not, but you could if you wanted to. Okay? If you wanted to know how many particles of gold you were making, Say you had a reaction and you produced this much, this many grams of, of gold. You could actually figure out exactly how many atoms of gold you, you produced in that chemical reaction. Because there's always a relationship between the mass of anything and the number of particles of that same thing. You just go through the molar mass conversion. That's all that's required. You take your mass, whatever it is, you go to the periodic table, you convert your masses into moles. You then use Avogadro's number to convert from moles into actual particles. And it'll be the same all the time, no exception. They're all, all those calculations are, 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 are handled the same way. Okay? Good. I can't tell you how important it is that you understand it. This is chemistry. This is it. You run reactions in a laboratory. Research labs, they run them on a micro scale using milligrams of, of substances. And they produce products and they figure out how much product they make using their reaction. Once they know that, they can scale it up and make all their profits. If it's feasible. If not, they throw it in the garbage and start over. Okay? All right, we're going to do a couple of conversions. Because of the importance of being able to convert between grams per moles and moles per grams, we're going to spend a little time on it. Because this is a calculation that I expect you to be able to do, just like this, in your sleep. Because the only thing you need to do it is that periodic table. And you'll have the periodic table for every exam, every quiz. First of all,
First of all, we're just going to do some molar mass calculations. I want you to get familiar with the term molar mass. The molar mass is nothing more than the formula mass from the periodic table in grams. So let's do some. We'll start off kind of easy. Notice that this is an ionic compound, right? And ionic compounds don't exist as molecules, but the term molar mass still applies. Okay? okay? It doesn't differentiate. I see so many textbooks, and it drives me nuts when I see that. When they call them molecular weights. Okay? It drives me nuts. They're not molecular weights. These don't exist as molecules. Okay, give me the molar mass. Oh, everybody have periodic tables? Just so happens I have some. The exact ones you guys need, in fact. Oh, everybody's got one, huh? Good. What's the answer? 95.1? 95.21? Units? What? Yes. That's what we need to be familiar with. The molar mass is one times the mass of magnesium plus two times the mass of CL. Um, I think that's 70.9 and change. Say 70.9 and magnesium was 24 point what? 31. 31. Um, and we're going to get 95.21. I used 95.21. Uh, um, with regard to significant digits and how many you want to take these out to, because you know some periodic tables they carry about four digits, two decimals. I think if you always carry, uh, the rule is is that you go you go two significant digits more than what will be required for your answer. But I didn't give you any piece of data up here. Let's keep it two decimals. Let's go two decimals, and you should be fine. Um, this is ninety-five. 0.21, here's the important part, grams of magnesium per one mole of magnesium. So everybody see that? Anytime, anytime you go to the periodic table with a formula, or even an element, it doesn't matter, every time you go to the periodic table and add up masses, Whatever that number is, is the number of grams in one mole of that substance, which gives you an almost infinite number of conversion factors because we have an infinite number of compounds. We don't, really, there's a finite number of compounds, but you can see we have a lot of conversion factors, right?
Big one? What is it? 160, I don't know. It's going to be 3 times sodium, 1 times phosphorus, 4 times oxygen, right? So 3 times sodium is what? 70. You did 22.9? Yeah. 68.97. 30.97. Uh, yeah, 30.97. Oh, yeah. 97. 64. 64? Mm -hmm. Zero, zero. So we add that up and we get what? 164. Grams per mole. Grams of Na3PO4 per one mole of Na3PO4. See how that works. Formula masses are the grams of that particular substance per mole. You see it back there? Got it? All right, let's use it now. Let's see how we use it now. Now, when we go to the periodic table, we get grams per mole, right? Whatever it is. So this conversion factor is only good to convert between moles and grams. You can't use it for anything else. It can't convert milliliters, it can't convert pounds, it can't do anything. When you go to the periodic table, it's only good to convert either moles into grams or grams into moles. That's all it can do. Okay? So no more limitations. Calculate the number of moles of O2 contained in 62.1 grams of O2. And I'm completely making these problems up, so I don't know where the answers are going to go. I don't want to necessarily take any out of out of the book because that'll be just more practice for you. Answer? 1.94 Yes, 1.94 mole O2. We start with our given information because that's what we always start with. We have 62.1 grams of O2. I have no idea where I'm going to go with my conversion. I just know that I must have grams of O2 in the bottom in the next fraction. 
so that they cancel. Wouldn't it be nice if I had a direct conversion between grabs and moles? I do. I get it from the periodic table. It is O2. Oxygen is 16. So O2 is 2 times 16, or 32. Where does the 32 go, top or bottom? It always goes with the grams, doesn't it? it always goes with the grams. Because what you add up is always per one mole. So this number is always one. This is the number you add up. 1.94 mole of O2 based on three significant digits. Remember, this is a conversion factor, and so it will not limit our significant digit calculations. I could have made this 1.000000 and gave it 10 significant digits. Either way, it would never be the one with the lowest number of digits. Everybody get that one? Everybody understand? Grab some moles, moles to grab. So in that case, we were given grams, which meant grams went on the bottom in our conversion factor, right? This one, we want to calculate the number of grams contained in a given amount or given number of moles. The number always goes with what? Okay. Right. What's the answer? 2.5 grams of H2O. Yep, that's what I got. Listen, you can talk yourself right out of the right thing to do here. Because in some cases you're going to say it can't be that easy. So don't. Let your, let your kind of, you know, your programming from the dimensional analysis, just let it take over. Okay? 
Write down our given information because that's always a great place to start. Again, I don't have a clue where I'm going to go. But in order for me to get rid of that unit, that unit has to be in the bottom on the next one. It has to be. I haven't even thought about where I want to go yet. I just wrote down my given and I put that unit in. Now I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to look at the problem and maybe think about a strategy. I need grams. I have moles. I, I, know, I know a gram per mole conversion. I can get that from the periodic table, right? I can go 1 times oxygen. I can go 2 times hydrogen. I got 18 grams per mole. Moles cancel out. I do the math to three significant digits. I get 22.5 grams of H2O. You can't just always say the number is going to go on the bottom or the top. You have to look at what you're given. If you're given moles, then in order to cancel moles, then the one goes in the bottom and the number goes on the top. The previous example, we were given grams which meant the number went in the bottom because the grams were in the bottom and one mole went in the top. So you always, you know, what are you solving for? Are you solving for moles given grams or are you solving for grams given moles? And that's going to flip your conversion uh, accordingly. Okay? You want to do a couple more? Or are we good? A couple more? Okay. <laughs> answer? 0.397 mole KVR. Yeah. Well, we start with our given, 47.2 grams KVR. That's R, believe it or not. Got to have grams of KBR here. 
I know what the grams per mole at KBR is uh, because I just added up. What is it? 118? 119? To get to exactly? or 119.00? Plus, yeah, okay. Cancel, divide it out. Hopefully, you get somewhere around 0 0.397 to three digits. Calculate the number of moles of NaOH in 0.95 mole of NaOH. Answer? We have 38 as well. 0 0.95 mole of NaOH. One mole of NaOH is um, 40 grams. grams of NaOH to two significant digits. Do these calculations. Why is the mole so important? Okay, chemical reactions. Chemical reactions. <clears throat> when you mix two substances together, or three or four, or whatever. There are certain things that you're looking for as evidence that a chemical reaction occurred. Certain observations that you can say, hey, something's going on there, right? And they list some in, in the book there. Um, color change, formation of a solid, 
um, evolution uh, of bubbles or a gas, call it a gas, you see it bubbling, or the beaker can get hot or the beaker can get cold. If the beaker gets hot, the reaction is liberating energy. If the beaker feels cold, it's taking energy in. Okay, we'll see that's exothermic and endothermic a little bit later. But when we write our chemical reactions, they're represented using a chemical equation. Don't worry, not a whole lot of math. And in a chemical equation, we have our reactants on the left side of an arrow, and the arrow points to the products. And you can interpret the arrow as produces or reacts to form or any of a number uh, of different uh, appropriate statements. But our reactants are on the left side, our products are on the right side. Okay, we read left to right, so this is consistent with how we read. Um, we can do an example. I'll do one and it's in the book. Actually, write the one and it's in the book. This is an example of a chemical equation used to represent this reaction. <clears throat> Once you have a reaction, you have to make sure it's balanced, it's mass balanced. We have this, this small law that governs the universe that says matter can't be created or destroyed. So whatever you start with in the reactants, you have to end with in the products, and you have to make sure that element by element, okay, that the number and types of one on the reactant side is equal to the number and types of elements on the product side. Okay, so we're just going to balance it. We're going to go back and forth. How many magnesiums on the left side? One. How many magnesiums on the right side? One. They're balanced. How many carbons? One. On the right side, carbons on the left? One. Balanced. How many oxygens on the left? Three. We've got two here and one here. That's three. How many on the right? Three. This is balanced. It's balanced as it sits. Okay? Let's try another one. Magnesium's on the left? One. How many on the right? One. Balanced. How many oxygens on the right? One. How many on the left? Two. Two. They're not balanced. So how do we balance it? Can we go like this? No, you can't go like that, can you? Because remember where this comes from. This is magnesium, two plus, it's in group two, and it's oxygen, group six, which is two minus. So when we're looking at making the formula, they're balanced, they're neutral right there. One magnesium, one oxygen. We can't change the number and types of elements within the formula. But we can change the number of formulas. I can put a big two out front. This is a coefficient. Or more correctly, a stoichiometric coefficient. But what this now says is this. 
I have two magnesium oxides. I have two of the entire formula now. Okay? So I balanced my oxygens, but at the same time I screwed up my magnesiums, didn't I? Now my magnesiums don't balance because I have two over here and one over here. So what do I need? I need a coefficient out here. Balancing chemical equations by inspection, which is what this is called, balancing by inspection, you're going back and forth, is really kind of a trial and error process. And the only way you get good at it is by practicing, 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 practicing. Now, this equation is now balanced, but it also would be balanced with these coefficients. Take a look, four magnesiums, four magnesiums, two, two is four, four. Okay? But the balanced chemical equation is the lowest whole number ratio between products and reactants. So the last thing you want to do after you're sure you're done balancing is you want to take a look at your stoichiometric coefficients and you want to make sure that they don't have a common factor. If they do, take it out. Okay? So. Let's see if we can find some in here. Now, these little symbols here, aqueous, This one's solid. These are uh, the phases. These show you what the current phase of these particular substances are. Aqueous means in water. It's dissolved in water. Okay? So if you take sugar and you dissolve it in water, you put a teaspoon of sugar in water and you stir it up and it dissolves, that's an aqueous or aqueous sugar solution. If you put sugar on your stove and heat it and melt it into a liquid, that's not aqueous. It's liquid. Okay? And solid is just what it sounds like. It's a solid. Go ahead and balance this.
Okay, how many bariums on the left side? That's BA. You better know that. How many bariums on the left side? One. One. How many BAs on the right? One. One. They're good. How many carbons on the right? You could, I mean, you could cheat a little bit, take a shortcut. You see the carbon in here, the polyatomic ion carbon in? CO3 here and CO3 here. So you could say I one carbonate, one carbonate, so they're balanced. When you balance chemical equations, you need to go atom by atom by <coughs> atom by atom. But if you see a polyatomic ion on both sides, you know, it's not horribly bad to, to balance the entire polyatomic ion. So I see one carbonate here, one carbonate here. How many K's, potassium's on the left? Two. How many on the right? One. How am I going to fix that? No, I can't do that, huh? Two. Now I have two KCLs. How many chlorines do I have on the right? How many on the left? Two. Two. I'm done. It's balanced. It's balanced. I take one last look, make sure my coefficients don't have a common uh, factor. I'm balanced with a 2 on my KCL. Okay? Balancing chemical equations takes practice, 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 practice. It's trial and error. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to get frustrated. If you get frustrated, just erase all your coefficients, start over from the first element. Go back. They will balance. From now on, you will not look at an equation without balancing it. It must be balanced, because an equation that's not balanced is worth zero to us. Nothing. It has to be balanced. Okay? Alright. So, why do we have to balance it? You might ask. Let's go back to our magnesium and magnesium oxide. If I were to look at this reaction and interpret it in words, I would say two atoms of magnesium react with one molecule of O2, it's a diatomic molecule, right, to produce two formula weights or formula masses of magnesium oxide formula units, right? That's what this says on the atomic slash molecular level. Or I could say two moles of magnesium reacts with one mole of O2 to produce two moles of MgO. The balanced chemical equation shows you how the substances react on an atomic or molecular basis, right down to the particle. Or alternatively, they show us how they react on the molar ratios. For every two moles of magnesium, I need one mole of O2 in order to produce two moles of magnesium oxide. Hmm. Does that mean if I give you a certain amount of magnesium, a certain mass, can you tell me how much magnesium oxide I should produce, assuming the reaction is 100% efficient? Can you do that? Heck yeah, you can. Is that valuable? Heck yeah, it is. Right? Let's look at it. Calculate the number of grams Now, I have to specify, um, when, you, when you put 
two things together and you start a chemical reaction that produces a product, the product is only going to be produced as long as both of these guys are here. As soon as one of them runs out, the reaction shuts down and product production stops, right? So I'm saying, look, you have enough O2. It's in the air. You have enough O2. Okay, so it's in excess. It's not going to run out first. The magnesium is what's going to run out. That's why I worded it this way. Okay? Now remember, the balanced chemical equation relates moles. Of course it relates atoms and molecules. But moles, that's the number we can work with. It doesn't relate grams. You can't say two grams of magnesium reacts with one gram of O2 to produce two grams of magnesium oxide. You can't say that because the balanced chemical equation only relates moles to moles to moles to moles. Right? It also relates atoms, but we're not going to talk about that. So what's my given information? 38.1 grams of magnesium. I know grams of magnesium has to be in the denominator in my next fraction. I need to know grams of MgO. Let's think about this for a second. If I knew how many moles of MgO I produced, I could easily convert that to grams using the molar mass. If I knew how many moles I could add up this formula mass and I could say x grams per mole. So I can convert moles of MgO into grams of MgO. My big question is, how do I get from grams of magnesium to moles of MgO? The balanced equation relates what? Moles, 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 moles. So does it do me any good to have one of my reagents in mass. Does it? So let's convert this into moles of magnesium first because this relates moles. If I can get moles of magnesium, I can use this relationship right here to convert moles of magnesium into moles of magnesium oxide. So moles of magnesium is 24.31 from the periodic table. Got this. PT is periodic table. Got this from the periodic table. Now I'm at moles of magnesium. I know I have to have mole of magnesium in my next one. Get it to cancel. Incidentally, we skip to the end of the book. Stoichiometry is at the end. I just felt it was more progressive to do the stoichiometry right after we did it, balancing equations. Right? So if you're watching the lecture later and you say, where the heck did he go? Go to the end. Do I know anything? Where do I want to take moles of magnesium? Can I take moles of magnesium to moles of magnesium oxide? I can't. What is that? Two and two. This tells me right here that for every two moles of magnesium, I produce two moles of magnesium oxide. This I got from the balanced equation. Got that from the balanced chemical equation. They're the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. 
Moles of magnesium are done. Now I have moles of magnesium oxide. Can I get grams of magnesium oxide from moles of magnesium oxide? Everybody in here better be shaking their head. How do I do that? Grams per mole. Where? Periodic table. One mole magnesium oxide is how many grams? Thirty point three one. Periodic table. I do my math. What do you get? Oh, 40. Thank you. What's the answer? Two, three digits, 63.2. 63.2 grams magnesium oxide. Okay, I'm gonna move make this a little smaller because I need some room here. The balanced chemical equation gives us a quantitative relationship between reactants and products, reactants and reactants, products and products. Meaning, if we're given any one of these, we can calculate any other one. Because the balanced equation gives us conversion factors that allow us to convert between one and another. The key is, is that it only allows us to convert moles. I started out with this reaction, this question, because this is absolutely as hard as these questions can get. First of all, they're all solved the same way. That's number one. Secondly, given grams and asked for grams is as long as this calculation can get. This is as hard as it gets. Okay? And we have a little road map. I can find it. Here it is. We have a little road map, and it just depends on where you're going to jump in on this. So we have grams of A. I'm going to run out. We'll try and make it across. I'll be able to make it across by race. I'm going to say given. We're saying this is A in the book. I 
I better do? I better be consistent. This is our little road map that allows us to go between any one of our reactants or products and any other one of our reactants and products. Look at what we did. We did as big and as long as a calculation as you could possibly do. We were given grams of magnesium. So we started here, grams of A. We had to convert our grams of A, magnesium, into moles of magnesium. And how did we do that? Molar mass from the periodic table. Once we had moles of magnesium, which was A, we wanted to get moles of what we desired, magnesium oxide. Coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. Once we had moles of B, in this case magnesium oxide, we wanted grams of B, we went back to the periodic table and got the molar mass. This is as long as a cal uh, of calculation as you're going to have to do. Okay, we're going to do a couple other ones that are short. This is called stoichiometry. It's called stoichiometry. It's the process of using coefficients of balanced chemical equations to quantitatively determine the amount or mass of one product or reactant given the mass of another product or reactant. And for that reason, these are often referred to as stoichiometric coefficients the stoichiometric coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. Okay. Let's do something. You know that you're going to start somewhere over here with either moles of A or grams of A and you're going to end over here. Grams of B or moles of B. You know that. You have to start, right here is our division point, right here. You're going to start over here and end over there. It's just a question of how many conversions you have to go through. the number of moles of O2 required, well, required to react with 1.78 moles of magnesium. Okay. 
Where are you? Moles of A. This is where we're starting. Where do we want to go? Moles of O2. That's where we want to go. We're given moles. We're asked for moles. Go ahead and do it. you to get the answer. <laughs> Look at you guys. This little road map is your friend. Right? You have grams per mole, right? Yeah. Where does it say molar mass? Yeah. Here's where we are. What's between our two arrows? This is where we're at. Moles of A, moles of magnesium, and we want moles of B. We don't go to the periodic table for this one. This one's a much smaller calculation. Use this road map. Where, wherever you're starting versus where you're finished is going to tell you what conversions you have to use. So I started out with 1.78 mole of magnesium, right? You were right on by putting mole of magnesium in the bottom. Now, where do you want to take mole of magnesium? Yes, you can take it to grams of magnesium. But what are you asked for? Mole of O2. Is there a direct conversion that will allow me to go between moles of magnesium and moles of O2? Is there? Yeah, there is. And where do I find it? Whatever is between the arrows, that's what you have to do. So, there is a direct conversion. I find it in the coefficients of my equation. I'm looking at magnesium, I'm looking at oxygen, this is a 1, even though it's not written, right? So I put a 1 there and a 2 there. Because a 1 goes with O2 and the 2 goes with magnesium. What do we have? Very good. Very good. 0 0.0890. Your calculator gives you an answer, 0.89, right? But that's only two significant digits. This answer has to be to three based on the 1.78. 0 0.890 mole of O2. Does everyone see how you use this? I promise you on the exam, and on the quizzes, and on the labs, and on everything, and on this, and on that, you're going to have to know this. You're going to have to know it and understand it. This roadmap is your friend. It tells you everything you have to do, and what conversions you need to know. Does everybody see this one? You see where we started and why I only used 
the coefficients of the balanced equation because I was asked given moles and I was asked for moles. Okay? We're going to do more. They're all the same. That's the beauty of it. The only thing that's going to change is the balanced equation and the formulas. But other than that, you, you approach these all the same. Calculate the number of grams of O2 required to produce 1.31 mole of magnesium oxide. We're going to assume that the magnesium is in excess, so um, the O2 is the one that's going to run out first. Want to know the number of grams? It's all the same equation, yeah. So where are we now? What were we given? What were we asked for? Just try it. Just try it this way. Watch how it works. Look what's between the arrows and it tells you where you need to go for your conversions. Given 1.31 mole magnesium oxide. Where am I? Right there. Given moles of A. I need to go to moles of B, which in this case is moles of O2. How do I do that? Balance that chemical equation. I'm looking for a relationship between this and this. I know mole of MgO goes on the bottom and mole of O2 on the top. 
two, one. They're gone. Now I'm here. Now I want to get the grams. I have to get the molar mass from the periodic table. One mole of O2, 32 grams of O2. Gone. I now have grams of O2 beginning with moles of magnesium oxide. That's what I was asked for. Do you see how it works? What's the answer? Three significant digits. Yeah, this one, the answer is actually 20.96, right? But the th three significant digits, this would be 21.0 grams of O2. I simply round that 9 to a 10, which pushes that up one number, one digit. Okay? All right. Let's try one last one where we go the full gauntlet, like we did before. Again, don't be confused by the, the wording on access and, and things like that. It just means that I'm just telling you that, that the oxygen is going to determine how much product is produced. The magnesium is going to be in far excess. So go ahead and do this.
this map. Okay, what do we have? Starting off with, not this marker, 41.7 grams of O2. I need to know, I'm comparing magnesium oxide with O2. I wish I could go directly to my balanced chemical equation, but my equation does not relate grams. So I'm starting here, and I have to get here. First thing I'm going to do is convert my grams of O2 into moles of O2. Gone. That's where I am. Now I'm here. I need to convert between moles of O2 and moles of MgO. I have one mole of O2, two moles of MgO. Now I'm here. Just use my stoichiometric coefficients. Now I need to get the grams of B. I'm going to use my molar mass. One mole of MgO. What did we say it was? 40.31? Done. What does that answer? 105. The three significant digits. That's as hard as a calculation can get. One where you use all three conversion factors. That's as hard as it gets. Okay, everybody good? Everybody see it? Okay, let's move on. So much fun stuff. There's a lot of stuff in this chapter. Good stuff. Okay. Okay. Classification of chemical reactions. I'm going to have to classify classify our reactions, we're going to have four basic classifications and then an extra, a redox. I'm going to show you a real easy way to do the redox. First we're going to have a combination. Sometimes this is called a synthesis. Sometimes it's called a synthesis. In a combination reaction, you're going to have a general reaction. Is A plus B goes to AB. All right? And for some examples, I'm going to, they're already balanced. Two Na solid plus Cl2 gas, G is gas, goes to two NaCl solid, or SO3 gas plus H2O gas, or sorry, liquid, goes to H2SO4, or the aquator. You can always tell a synthesis or a combination reaction because you have less formulas on the product side than you do on the reactant side because they're combining. 
See over here how we have two and then it went to one? Here we had two and it went to one. That's how you can usually tell a combination because you take a whole bunch of things on the reactant side, you combine them into lesser things on the product. Now the masses and everything are still going to balance, right? Everything's still going to be there. But you have, you know, you have two symbols over here and only one compound over here. So they're combined. Right? So that's how you identify. A decomposition Decomposition reaction is the opposite. It's the opposite. This is going to be AB going to A plus B. Look at these, and these are the opposite of each other. Okay, the opposite of the combination. Here, you're starting out with one thing, and it's breaking down into two or more things. Decomposition occurs over time where things, complicated molecules, decompose into the more simpler or, or more fundamental building blocks. Okay? Uh, it takes energy to keep things together. These build-up processes, these anabolic processes in the body. Um, these aren't occurring in the body, but you see how we only have one here and it breaks down into two? That's how you can tell a decomposition. Decomposition reactions. Everybody copy those? I'd like to keep them up and use the other board, but I think the camera's only on this board. Next we have a single replacement. Single replacement, we have a term, we don't. Yeah, we do. A single replacement, you can tell because this is going to be um, element reacting with a compound or an elemental form, right? Cl2, we could have um, the diatomic molecules or any one of a number of active metals like zinc. Uh, copper. Um, the general reaction here is they have one here, A plus BC going to AC plus B. And in this case, you see that A replaced B in the compound. But it's always a dead giveaway because you have an element. have an element reacting with a compound and the element is going to replace one of the elements in the compound. It's a single replacement. Usually it's a metal and it involves a replacement of the cation in the first one. Um, these are also redox, by the way. These are also uh, called redox reactions. So we have another one here. Uh, that's evacuated.
There's another example. Uh, in that second example, the iron, the solid iron, replaced the copper in the copper sulfate. One replacement. Single replacement. This is how you have to identify. You're not going to have to predict the products or anything. What you're going to be asked to do is say, here's a reaction, what is it? Is it um, combination, decomposition, single replacement, or the last one, double replacement? So you're just going to have to identify them. We're actually going to do that in lab today, right? You guys did that in lab this morning. Double replacement. A double replacement is a compound reacting with a compound. And we have two replacements. People are swapping. This is our general reaction. Parentheses. They're somewhat confusing. You know, I don't necessarily like this. I like to see the actual thing. We're going to have two compounds, right? Here's an example. Silver nitrate plus potassium iodide and silver iodide. Should be a solid, I think. Plus KNO3. And I'm not as bad. So notice we have two compounds here. Here's one compound. Here's another compound. And all we're doing is two replacements. The potassium is replacing the silver as nitrate's partner. And that's one replacement. And the silver is replacing potassium as iodide's partner. That's the second replacement. They're just one. You're just going to have to identify them. All right, now predict the products. All right? Just for identity purposes. Let's learn those little shortcuts. Now you will have to predict the products in lab and possibly on a quiz. in a precipitation reaction. Precipitation reactions. These are reactions that result, as the name would suggest, in the formation of a solid, which we call precipitate or precipitation. Now, in order to do precipitation reactions, we're going to do three types of reactions. The first is we're going to have the balanced formula equation. Now, this is going to require us to predict products. This is not a terribly difficult thing to do with a few basic skills in place. So let's get an example. Well, he doesn't want you predicting the products. Um, let's do one from lab. example from lab. I'll take you all the way through one. 
I'm going to pick number two. Lead nitrate and potassium ion. Um, Take a look at mixing these two chemicals together, okay? And this is lead 2 nitrate and potassium iodide. What we first want to do is predict the products, okay? Now, when we predict the products, we want to look at the ions that are produced from each of the reactants. Just the ions, okay? Lead 2 nitrate. Now, this is not how it is, and it's grossly oversimplified. But think about lead with two nitrates in its crystal structure. If we break that, we're going to produce lead 2, lead plus 2, and nitrate. I know that we're producing two nitrates per lead 2 nitrate. We're producing two for every one formula unit. But I'm not concerned with the number yet. I'll take the number up when I balance the equation. Right now, I'm just looking at what ions are produced when this dissolves. What ions are produced when this dissolves? Okay? Now I'm going to swap them. I'm predicting products, which means I'm simply going to swap these two guys right here. I'm now going to put lead 2 where K used to be. I'm going to go write a good formula, a good neutral formula between PB and I. Because PB was with the nitrate, now it's with the I. I look at PB2+, plus, I is minus 1, it's group 7, negative 2 plus 2, PBI2. That's the formula of one of my products. I'm now going to swap the potassium for the iron, or the lead 2. Now potassium is nitrate's partner. They swapped. I have K plus, I have NO3 minus, plus and minus, they cancel out. There's my formula. I know that there are two nitrates here. I know that. But the only reason why there are two nitrates here is because nitrate, which is negative one, happen to combine with a plus two cation, namely lead. That doesn't guarantee, predict, or otherwise influence what nitrate is going to combine with on the product side. And it didn't, did it? Nitrate didn't combine with a plus two on the product side, it combined with a plus one, the potassium. So our products are this. I swap the cations. I then look at the cation-anion combination and I write a good neutral formula for the new compound. I do it for both of them. That's how I predict my products. I know what most of you are going to do. This is what most of you are going to do. I'm going to do a swap, so it's going to be KNO32 plus PBI. That's what you're going to do. You're literally <clears throat> just going to swap them. Okay? You have to look at the ions that are produced. Not the numbers. Don't look at the number of ions produced by each formula. We'll take care of that now when we balance. Just look at it and say, this is going to produce PB2, 
This is going to produce NO3 minus. This is going to produce K plus. This is going to produce NO3 minus. Oh, wait. No, sorry. K plus and I minus. Right? And then just swap the two. Right? Good formulas. Those are good formulas. Okay? You don't just swap them. Sometimes you can. If everything's plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, you can do a straight across swap and it's going to be fine. But when you do the swap, you have to make sure to make a good neutral formula between the new partners. Okay? You're putting potassium with nitrate, not with two nitrates. Two is only because this happened to be plus two. Okay. So we predicted our product. Now, we need to balance it, right? Let's balance it. How many leads on the left side? One. How many on the right? They're, got, they're balanced. How many iodides? Two. Two. How many iodides? One. What do we need? Two. How many potassiums? Two. Two. How many potassiums? One. What do I need? Two. How many nitrates? Six. How many? Six. Well, that's oxygen, right? You want to count the oxygens or you just want to look at? How many nitrates? Two. Two. How many nitrates? It's balanced. It's now balanced. You just started out from scratch. Okay? I think on the quiz and on the exam, you may be given this already balanced. So you won't have to predict the products, but I'm doing you one more. Pay your fees, you're going to get your full money's worth. All right? Now I want to write my total ionic equation. Now, some of you may have noticed that all of these are ionic compounds because they contain what? A metal. They all have a metal. Lead, potassium, these are metals. A vast number of ionic compounds are soluble. That is, they break apart and form ions. A number of ionic compounds do that, but some of them don't. And in order for us to know which ones don't, we have to look at our table, which is on page 410. I think it's also in the lab on page 4-5. In the lecture notes, it's 4-10. Everybody see that table? Open up and look at that table, because I want to go through it with you. Because I don't really like the way it's written. Okay. Soluble compounds. You have soluble compounds, and then you have exceptions. You see the exceptions? The exceptions only apply to the elements that they're directly across from. So, in the first one, soluble compounds, all sodium, potassium, and ammonium compounds are soluble. No exceptions, because there are no exceptions across from them. Right? Down at the bottom, or more towards the bottom, it says all chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble except when chlorides, bromides, and iodides are with lead 2, silver, mercury 1. See that? All sulfates are soluble except calcium sulfate, barium sulfate, lead 2 sulfate. Everybody see that? So where it says in the top all sodium, potassium, and ammonium compounds are soluble, 
That doesn't mean that the exception is, is lead 2, silver, mercury 2. Those exceptions don't go with them. Everybody see how we read it? The table should have lines on it, obviously. That would create a lot less confusion. Insoluble compounds means they don't break apart. So all carbonates and phosphates are insoluble. They don't break apart, except sodium, potassium, and ammonium. See how we read them? Okay. So, that in mind, lead to nitrate, will that break apart? Yes, why? All nitrates are soluble, right? No exception. So we break it apart and show it in its ionic form. Again, if we look, and this is not right, but we look at the crystal or the solid, we break this, we make one lead two plus two nitrate. And you don't have to memorize these, these solubility rules. I'm going to show you how you know in a, in, in a little bit how you know which ones break apart and which ones don't without needing the solubility rules. How about the Ki? Does that break apart? Yes. Yeah. How about the potassium nitrate, does that break apart? Yeah. Yep, because all potassium compounds are soluble and all nitrates. You only needed one, but you had them both. How about lead to iodide, does that break apart? No, no it doesn't, does it? Why? Lead 2. All iodides, chlorides, and bromides are soluble, except when the iodides, chlorides, and bromides are with lead 2. This is lead 2. So I don't break it apart. I keep it together. I applied my solubility rules. Anything that broke apart according to the solubility rules is shown broken apart in its ionic form. This is what we're doing in the lab today, by the way. Our net ionic equation. Our net. Our net. That's what we get, right? That's what we get. We got a gross pay, we got our net pay. A net pay is the only thing that matters, right? That's the only thing that means anything to us. Gross doesn't mean anything. In order to get the net ionic equation and find out what's really going on in the beaker, we have to cancel out what we call spectator ions. Now, what are spectators? Spectators just watch, right? They don't participate. So, anything that exists in the exact same form on both sides of the arrow can be canceled out as a spectator ion. PB2. Do I have one on the left side? I do not. I have lead, but it's not lead 2. Two. 2NO3. Two do I have that on the left side? I do. Goodbye. It's gone. I can make things disappear. 2K plus, is that on the right side? <coughs> yes. Incidentally, if you only had 1K plus over here, but you had K plus, but it was 1, go back and balance. You made an error balancing. Because when you balanced, literally, you said the number of particular ions on one side equal the number on the other. So we can draw a line through that. I minuses, do I have any? No. Bring down what's left.
So I go to the lead 2 nitrate store and I buy some solid lead 2 nitrate and I put it in water and the lead 2 nitrate doesn't exist anymore. Now I got a bunch of lead 2's and a bunch of nitrate ions floating around in my beaker. Then I go to the potassium iodide store. It's right around the corner. And I get some more solid Ki. And I put it in water. And I don't have any more solid Ki. I've got a bunch of K pluses and I minuses floating around in my beaker. I mix the two beakers together. And the lead runs around and finds two iodide ions because they're more stable together than they are apart floating around in solution. So the lead finds the two iodide ions and it precipitates out as a solid and you say chemical reaction occurred. Solid just formed. More specifically it'll be a yellow solid. Okay, this is what's happening. This is what your net ionic equation says. You still have your nitrates and your potassiums floating around because they are more stable floating around as ions than they are together. You could filter off the yellow solid and evaporate the water and you would get potassium nitrate crystallizing back out after you evaporate the solvent. Okay? But you don't have to memorize these solubility rules to be able to perform this task, which you'll be asked to do on the exam. Because each one of these will be labeled. And if it has an AQ on it, which I can't even write, you're going to break it apart. That's how you know to break it apart in ions, because it's got AQ. Now, if we look at this, if it doesn't break apart, it's going to have an S on it. Why didn't the nitrate break apart? What is the nitrate? What's N and O? What are they? No? Non-metals. These are non-metals, which means what's holding them together? What kind of bond? Covalent bond. Covalent bond. The bonding that holds the nitrogen to the oxygen is covalent and is different than the bonding that holds the nitrate to the lead two. That's ionic. This bond is now broken by placing the salt in water. So it doesn't break apart. So we have to go back through And we have to label every single one of these either aqueous or solid. This is actually well number two of lab four what we're going to be doing today. This is what you need to give full credit. You need to have your formula equation balanced. You need to show everything broken up. You need to have the aqueous and solid labeled. You need to show your net ionic equation. So those of you that had lab this morning just got an answer. Those of you that have it tonight just got an answer. Okay. All right. These are precipitation reactions because they result in the formation of a solid. Now these aren't the only ones. You can form a liquid with these two, but we won't do that. All right. Again, you won't need the solubility rules. All right. 
Everybody good? Okay, let's look at a subclass of our single replacement reaction. These are called redox reactions. Redox. Redox is short for oxidation reduction. These reactions involve or are characterized by transfer of electrons. And if we're transferring electrons around, what are we making? Ions, right? We're changing oxidation states. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you a real easy, sim simple, quick method to do these redox reactions. It doesn't require an in-depth understanding of how the mole of electrons is being transferred. Okay? But you'll get the answer right every time. All right? So let's just do an example. Let's do zinc and copper chloride. Zinc plus copper 2 chloride goes to um, zinc chloride plus copper. And these will be solids. No, we didn't label. This will be aqueous. I cannot do that. Like Notice this is a single replacement reaction. This is an element reacting with a compound. Right? Now, we already know a lot about how to solve these reactions without even knowing that we knew it. We know how to assign oxidation numbers based on the location of the element in the periodic table. If it's in group number one, it's plus one. Bless you. If it's in group number two, it's plus two. If it's in group number three, it's plus three. Group four, we'll leave that go. Group 5, they're minus 3. Group 6, they're minus 2. Group 7, they're minus 1. So we already know how to assign a lot uh, oxidation numbers to a lot of different elements. What we may not know, though, is that if an element is written in its natural state, it has an oxidation number of 0 unless otherwise shown. So when you see zinc here, its oxidation number is 0. Don't give it an oxidation number. If you see magnesium written by itself like this, don't take it upon yourself to say it's plus two or two pluses, right? Don't write it in there. If it's not written in there, it's not meant to be there. If it's written by itself, it's zero. Okay? So the first thing you have to do, really the first thing and only thing you have to do, is go through and assign oxidation numbers to all of the elements individually. So, zinc is zero. What is copper in this formula? Two plus. How did you know that? Because chloride is minus one and you have two of them. The girl's doing her work. Everybody see that? This is the most important thing. This is all you have to do. Once you do this correctly, I'm going to show you how to get the answers. But you have to do this correctly. You have to assign those oxidation numbers correctly. So, I will take the time to show you. Do you understand? Everybody's shaking their head. A bunch of liars. <laughs> okay, 
How about zinc? What's zinc oxidation number? It's not written by itself, is it? It's two. See, now it's with the chloride. What's copper? See how it's written by itself? Now it's zero. You see it? Once you've assigned the oxidation numbers in a redox reaction, take a step back and look at the elements whose oxidation number is changing from what it was on the reactant side to what it becomes on the product side. What elements are undergoing the oxidation number changes? Zinc. And copper. Redox reactions are made up of two half reactions, the oxidation half and the reduction half. And together they form a full redox. So we refer to them as the half reactions. If you have yourself a redox reaction, one of your oxidation numbers is going to be changing in the positive direction, the other one is going to be changing in the negative direction. Zero to plus two, plus two to zero. One of them will be reducing. Plus two to zero is reducing, isn't it? That's the reduction half reaction. That is my shorthand for reaction. It's RXN. <clears throat> Does everyone see how I identified that? I assign my oxidation numbers. I find the elements who are undergoing oxidation number changes. The, the element that's getting smaller in its oxidation number as you go react into product is reducing. Reduction half reaction. That means the other one must be... What's the other one? You can't have... The, one's reduction, what's the other one? Oxidation. You can't have oxidation without reduction. Okay? It all started with assigning the oxidation numbers finding the elements who are undergoing oxidation number changes. The one getting smaller is the reduction half. The other one is the oxidation half. You will be asked, what is oxidized? What is reduced? I don't, I don't like those terms. I, I don't even know what they mean. Oxidation, reduction. I do, but I don't. Okay? First of all, your answer has to come from the product side, or sorry, the reactant side. Because what is oxidized and what is reduced is on the reactant side. These are the products of oxidation reduction. They are not what is oxidized or what is reduced. So, what is oxidized comes from the reactant of the oxidation reaction. What is oxidized? Zinc zero. What is oxidized comes from the reactant of the oxidation half reaction. What is reduced 
comes from the starting material of the reduction half reaction. So what's reduced? Very good. Copper 2, right? You, it could be copper 2 or copper 2 chloride, but it's definitely not copper, huh? Because this is copper. Remember, the name of the element is reserved for how that element exists. So when you say copper, this is what you mean. Zero. Copper zero. And that is over there. Products. I'm telling you right now, on the quiz, tomorrow. No. We have an exam tomorrow, right? No, this isn't on it though, is it? It's for our next exam, exam number two. I promise you, you're going to be asked what's oxidized and what's reduced. Because it's an easy question to write answers for. What's oxidized, what's reduced? This is an answer, this is an answer, this is an answer, this is an answer. It's the easiest question to create four answers on a multiple choice exam. You will have to do it. Do another one. Take your time with these. The procedure is very straightforward. Do one um, out of the book, mostly because I can think of one. Time. what I told you. Are you looking around in your book? Do what I told you. Assign the oxidation numbers to each element. Once you've done that, you've got the thing lit. The problem's over. It just becomes an uh, exercise in
Sign the oxidation numbers. You are. You only get this one zero. You guys, one thing that you can't forget. What is BR2? What's BR2? Is that one of the diatomics? It is. Remember there are seven and they start with nitrogen and they go three over. N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. And then H2. So Br2 is the natural state. That's the elemental state of bromine. The diatomic molecules exist as pairs in nature. They don't exist by themselves. That doesn't mean you can't make them. Okay, you can make individual bromine atoms. But in nature, it exists as Br2. All of the diatomics do. That's their elemental form. So this is zero. That might be your little trickster. That might be the bad one. Manganese is uh, four plus because oxygen is minus two. And we have two of them, that's minus four. H is plus. Br is minus one. Br is still minus one, which makes manganese over here two plus. H is still plus one, this is minus two. So our change is manganese, four plus, going to manganese, two plus, and Br minus, going to Br2, zero. Now I know these don't charge or mass balance. Okay, we're not getting into that kind of depth where we mass balance and charge balance redox. Okay. Well, which one's getting smaller? Manganese is going from plus four to plus two. Manganese four. This is our reduction half. Br minus going to zero is actually in the positive direction, right? This is our oxidation. <clears throat> So what is oxidized? You can look for the individual answers. The answer will probably be HBr, okay, because that's where the Br minus is. But in reality, molecules are not oxidized or reduced. Individual atoms are. Carbon atoms are oxidized. Okay, so the real or real technical answer is. Br minus is oxidized to Br20. But it could be written as HBr. What's reduced? Manganese 4 ion, right? Or manganese 4 oxide. This might be a choice, MnO2. But MnO2 and Mn plus 4 will not both be a choice. It'll be one or the other. It'll be this or this. But it is actually the manganese.
that is oxidized. It's going from plus four to plus two. It's not manganese oxide, right? That's redox in a nutshell. I guarantee you that you'll have some of those. You know we have our exam tomorrow. Make sure you look at that. Okay, a couple of last things before we finish up. Energy. Energy and chemical reactions. Okay, there's really only two ways energy can be used in chemical reactions. It's either absorbed or it's liberated. All right? If energy is absorbed, call that an endothermic reaction. tell that you have an endothermic reaction because the beaker will get cold. We have an example here. It's a reactant. So IE PBO led to oxide plus carbon, which is a solid, plus 26 kilocalories goes to lead solid plus carbon monoxide. See how energy is a reactant here? Energy has to be added to the reaction in order to get the reaction to go. And sometimes that can be provided by a flame, a laser, um, any kind of heat, you know, the environment, whatever. Exothermic. In an exothermic reaction, energy is given up. Energy appears as a product. Beaker gets hot. Beaker would get hot in an exothermic reaction. And again, we have an example of one. Hopefully I can get that in there. Which I probably can. Try C3 H8. This is propane gas, by the way. Plus O2 from the atmosphere. Gives off CO2 gas plus water plus a little bit of energy, 531 kilocalories. It's kind of a lot of energy, actually. That's propane, so you'll probably cook with it. You do. It's what's in your gas grill, right? What's wrong? C3H8 gas. 5O2 gas. 3CO2 gas. 
plus H2OL for liquid plus 531 kilocal. Last thing, reversible reactions. Some reactions are reversible, which means there's a forward reaction and there's a reversible, a reverse reaction. If you have a reverse, a reversible reaction, I don't think we have an example. No, we don't. I'm going to use some generic generic um, terms. <clears throat> this is the forward reaction. Because we read left to right, the forward reaction is always defined as a left to right. And this is the reverse reaction. <clears throat> At equilibrium, the rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse. But an equilibrium is not established right away. When you start out a reaction, reversible or not, you start out with two reactants. In this case, let's say A and B. And you dump A and B together. And for a little while, only the forward reaction is running. And it's producing amounts of C and D. As soon as you hit a threshold amount of C and D, you can initiate the reverse reaction. I mean, obviously, right, right before you mix A and B, you don't have any C, D in there. So you can't have a reverse reaction. So for a time, the forward reaction is the only one that's running. As soon as you, you create or form a threshold amount of product, the reverse reaction is initiated. But they're still not occurring at the same rate. Eventually, you'll produce enough CD where the rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse, and it looks like you're at steady state. Because A and B is breaking down as fast as it's being formed. So it looks like nothing's happening, but you're really in a state of dynamic equilibrium. It's really moving. Okay? So at equilibrium, The rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse. That doesn't mean that the concentrations are equal. They could be, but it's not a requirement. The only thing that's a requirement is that the rate of AB breakdown to form CD equals the rate of CD breakdown to form AB. So the concentrations of A and B and C and D are constant at equilibrium. And they can form a ratio, which we would call the equilibrium constant. Products over react. Okay, but at equilibrium, rate of forward equals rate of re reverse. That does not require the concentrations to be equal. They could be, but that's only one possible case. Okay, question.